Welcome one and all to the very first ever Docs Footy Talk podcast. This is the podcast show where we talk about all things football from AFL to the AFLW. This is your host, Alex Doherty. We're steering this machine today and we have so much to talk about both in the women's football and in the men's football. We are less than two weeks out from the premiership season. We are about one week, we are one round away from who's in the AFLW Grand Final. We've got a lot to talk about. Let's not dilly-dally. Let's not muck around here. Let's get straight into the women's football. For those who do enjoy the women's game as much as myself, big, big weekend of football, round six. A lot of, lot of, uh, lot of unexpected results, to be honest. Uh my my Western Bulldogs couldn't get the job done over GWS. We'll talk about that. Collingwood upsetting Brisbane and Adelaide. The Adelaide Football Club still in with a chance to contend for this year's grand final as they overcame a really, really strong Fremantle side on on Friday night. They got over 6440 to 5636. Four, only four points separating the two sides. Aaron Phillips, three goals. She was incredible once again. Did it on one leg. Angela Foley, 15 disposals. Courtney Cramey, 13 disposals. Sarah Allen and Chelsea Randall, absolutely magnificent in defence. Allen, in particular, awarded the rising, one of the Rising Star nominations for this week. I think she's thoroughly deserved that one, to be honest. We'll get to that a little later on. Aaron Phillips, three goals. We'll talk about her in just a second. Ebony Marinoff, 16 tackles. Very, very good for the Crows again. While staying a hooker for the Dockers, 20 disposals and two goals. Having another great year. Absolutely outstanding year for her. Back to back to Erin Phillips. I've got to talk about her for a moment. Kicked three goals on one leg on Friday night. A few weeks ago, she kicked four goals in her first game of the year against the Dogs. Are the crows too? Are the crows too reliant on it? I've just got. To, I've just got to wonder about that because let's let's not let's not sugarcoat the fact that Aaron Phillips is an outstanding player, fantastic player, can turn the game on her head almost whenever she wants. But this year has really shown, has really exposed, I should say, has really exposed Adelaide's team. Because she missed the first two games with a quad injury. They got comprehensively beaten by Brisbane. And they got pummeled by Melbourne before she came back in. Now, this quad injury has, hasn't has really slowed her down, really. Because she came back the week up in round three against the Bulldogs. Kicked four goals, match-winning effort. That was something to watch. Although, I must say, as a Bulldog supporter, it got a little frustrating at times that we had no answers for her. She is absolutely top of the class still. However, the problem with Adelaide is, and this is probably why they're going to miss the fo- the grand final, is because there isn't really many other players that can that you know support her. You think back to last year when they won the grand final. Ad- Ad- Adelaide weren't even the best team in the league. They lost a couple of games. Somehow got lucky against Brisbane. That that was that's. That was my take on it then. It's my take on it now. They got very lucky to beat the Brisbane Lions last year. Phillips, apart from Phil, apart from Everty Marinoff, Chelsea Randall's a really good player. Maybe even to an extent Sarah Perkins. There isn't, and and Courtney Cramer, I should say, she's a very underrated defender. There is, there aren't really, there aren't, there aren't really many other players. That you know, do much. They, they they don't get the results that resemble a winning team. Now in the other two games they played with Phillips in the side, they played GWS in the wet. That was a draw, and they beat Carlton, who's probably going to win the wooden spoon. We'll get to that a little later on. But. It, it it just doesn't sit right with me. I don't think Adelaide are going to win the flag. Aaron Phillips, I think, 
the Crows are very, very reliant on it. And you can't be too reliant on it. Because if you are too reliant on somebody, <laughs> it's it's a team game. You can't just you can't just rely on one player to get the job done week after week. You need a whole array of players. You need you need twenty one players in, on a women's side to be precise. You need twenty one even contributors, and that's the only reason Adelaide won the flag last year is because Aaron Phillips played an exceptional game of football. And and the rest followed. There is a presence about her that makes her teammates around her great, but when she's not on the field, it's so evident that they're not that good. A few a few of her teammates that can pull their weight, Ebony Mariner, for for example, laid sixteen tackles, continuing a, an absolutely tremendous year. A couple of weeks ago in the GWS, she broke. The all-time AFL record in tackles, twenty-one, and that was and that was against GWS, a side that do that do rely on pressure footy. Is she the greatest tackler in the game? <laughs> it's too early to say that, but if she continues this, there is no doubt she will. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that she will. Average ten tackles a game last year in the in the first ever women's season. Nobody else came close. Nobody else came close. And she's even bettering it this year. I think she's averaging, what now, 12, 12 tackles a game, I think? Yeah. Something like that. She's bettered her average. She's bettered her tackling average. And, yeah, some of it plays a part. It's that huge tackling game, 21 tackles. Nobody's ever done that. And the fact that she can win her own footy and... Play a really strong role in the midfield. She she will be a. Uh, it's not even ridiculous to suggest that she will be a best and fairest winner. She she will be a league best and fairest winner. She'll probably win this year's be, uh, club best and fairest. I I reckon no one's going to come close to it. Aaron Phillips hasn't played enough games, and really and and I think maybe Chelsea Randall maybe would be the only threat to it because I think she's had another outstanding year as well. The uh, mar- marquee player. Dana Hooker, 20 disposals, two goals for the Dockers. I think a lot of people are underrating her. She won Fremantle's best and fairest last year and she's continuing to put up pretty good numbers this year. She- and a lot of people are saying, do they, do they matter? Well, yeah. Fremantle aren't, Fremantle aren't winning games. They're a lot better this year, actually, than what people are trying to make it out to be. They had a poor first game against the Bulldogs. Couldn't score. Couldn't score in the first half. But apart, but after that game, they've actually been pretty competitive in most of their other matches. There's a lot to like about this Fremantle side. And, you know, you got Cara Dinellon, who's who's having another exceptional year in the midfield. Haley Miller's playing really good football. Lisa Webb is somebody who I've really underestimated, but she's having a terrific year as well. And you've got young girls such as Taylor McAuliffe, M. McGuire's had a really good season since she's uh, come since she's coming to the side. And you got Kira Bowers to come back in the side as well. And she, and when she's fit, when she's fully fit. Kiara Bowers can almost be a top 10 player. On a scale of 1 to 10 to Fremantle season, I reckon it's going to be a solid 6. Well, they've only won two games. They were pretty poor against the Bulldogs, but apart from that, they've really been competitive. They've given sides a run for their money. <laughs> Hell, they even beat Melbourne. They beat a, They beat a premiership contender. So... It's not an awful season for Fremantle, and I think they'll build on that. Michelle Cowan's job will probably be safe. There is no doubt about it. She's one of the one of the best female coaches in the land, and a lot of people were quick to write her off after the first year. Fremantle were pretty poor; they finished seventh in the league last year. But she ha- she is a really good coach, and I think this year kind of proved it. With I wouldn't say the lack of talent, but what she had to work with. Most of the top 
the top names in Western Australia are in other parts of parts of the nation. You know, you've got Chelsea Randall in Adelaide, you've got Sabrina Frederick Traub over in Brisbane. Renee Fourth in GWS, Kate Swanson is also in GWS, Emma Kings in Collingwood. They're all WA players. They're probably the best WA players in the land at the moment, along with Cara Dunellen, who's already there. But free but Fremantle fans shouldn't be concerned about where they're heading. I think they're in a good I reckon they're in a good space, good headspace heading into next year. And they'll def- and they'll definitely challenge. On to the game on Saturday afternoon. Uh, Brisbane taken down by last place Collingwood Football Club. 5-9-39 Brisbane, Collingwood 8-5-53. Moana Hope and Christina Bernardi with three goals. Jasmine Garner kicked one goal three, but I think she had about 20 possessions. And Chloe Malloy and and Jess Duffin, both exceptional players in defence, 18 disposals each. While for Brisbane, all single goal scorers, Emily Bates had 20 disposals. Katie Stanton had 18 disposals. And Kate Lutkins continuing her great year in defence with 18 disposals. Also kicked a goal as well. The Pies were 34 points ahead in this game at one point, early in the last quarter. That's that's just probably just an example of how crazy this year has been so far. <laughs> it's hard to assess where Collingwood are at at the moment. They pretty much did what they did last year. They started the year really poorly. Zero and three from round four onwards. They're two and one at the moment. And they play Adelaide next week. We'll get into that a little bit later. But they they have a strong chance to do what they did last year and finish the year strong. Where in the hell are they at? It's so, Collingwood is so difficult. You know, we watched Collingwood play the Bulldogs last week and played like, and they played like a side that weren't fitting that weren't befitting of a eighth place spot. Ever since ever since Kate Sheehan called out Wayne Seekman and suggested that he's in a bit of trouble for his coaching job, Collingwood just been Collingwood just stepped it up. They beat Melbourne. They beat them pretty well, I must say too. They beat them by about thirty two points. They could have beaten the Bulldogs. Maybe they should have. They were very aggressive, and and maybe there were a few. And probably the only thing that cost them the win in the end was a few ill discipline acts. But Collingwood, so, something has clicked mid year with the Collingwood Football Club. I don't know what it is, and their side's not even that bad. It, it's it's not it's not a genuine wooden spoon team. There is a lot of talent on. There is a lot of talent in every line. The cap, the captain, and and they did. They had this win without the captain Steph Kiyoshi. Uh And she, she's a really good player, Steph Kiyoshi. Don't get me wrong on that one. So it's, it's it's so hard. To, it's so hard to understand Collingwood. They'll probably they'll probably end up bottom two, maybe. Uh, if, I, if we were to rate Collingwood's year at the moment. You'd, you'd it'd be in the middle, be right in the middle of five. You had that poor first three weeks. They were really awful against Carlton. That was probably one of the worst games of the year. And I, I don't, I don't say that because I hated the game. It was just a really scrappy game. It was really ugly and low scoring. And that's probably that's probably the one thing that upsets AFL fans in general is seeing a game that's a lack of scoring and. Very, very little skill. And then they lo- then they lost the next two games as well. They lost pretty convincingly to uh, Fremantle in at Optus Stadium, and then they then they lost to GWS, who at the time they were also winless. So, and then since then they've yeah you know, as as we said earlier they've they've thumped, they beat Melbourne pretty comprehensively. They gave the Bulldogs a run for their money. They probably should have beaten them, and they've. Thumped last year's grand finalists. They were thirty-four points up in the early, early in the last quarter. And Brisbane, they really should have been up for this game. They they have been they are in a world of strife next week when they play GWS because GWS are probably one of the more informed sides in the league right now. We'll get to them just a set. We'll get to them just a minute because they did pull off a really good upset 
on Saturday night against the Western Bulldogs in Canberra. But the Brisbane Lions should should be nervous. The, is Kate looking? Is Kate Lutkins the number one defender in the competition? At the moment, you'd have to say yes. She's having that standing year. I think she's at, what she's averaging now. I think she's averaging about sixteen touches. Yeah, she's averaging about seventeen and a half touches, averaging about three and a half marks per game. And she's and she's rarely beaten. She's rarely beaten in the one on one contest. And she even pushed up forward to kick a goal last week. That was how maybe a little sign about how desperate Brisbane were to get back into this match against Collingwood. But Kate Lutkins can play almost wherever she likes. She's uh she's prob- she would probably be the number one defender in the competition right now. All Australian, definitely lock her in. Full back, no problem. Her and Leah Kasler probably form one of the most probably form the most formidable one two punch in the A- in AFLW in terms of in terms of defensive efforts. They they are very hard to beat. The GWS Giants they play the Brisbane Lions next week. And they'll go into ne- and they'll go into next week having beaten the league leaders, the Western Bulldogs, to the tune of eighteen points, seven four forty six, four four twenty eight. We'll get to Courtney Gum in a second because she was absolutely phenomenal, and Alicia Eva as well, another recruit GWS have brought in as well, had a really great game, nineteen disposals, seven tackles, and a goal. Jess Dalpos, probably one of her better games this year, fifteen disposals and a goal. Uh, for the dogs, Emma Carney, Ellie Blackburn, your usual suspects are up there for the dogs. Carney had 22 disposals, 8 tackles. Ellie Blackburn had 18 disposal, 4 tackles. Whilst Kirsty Lamb has been a real surprise packet this year. She, she's continues her good form, 16 disposals. Over to Courtney Gum. Perhaps one of, probably the best recruit of the year so far. Alicia Eva is probably going to be a close second. Because what Courtney Gum produced on, on Saturday night, was an absolute corker of a game. 23 disposals, took a lot of saving marks in defence, kicked a goal in the last quarter. She is, she has been sensational. She's been an absolute ripper of a recruit this year. I think she's averaging, what now, 16 disposals a game. She's she's really hard at it. She, she She's a real hard at it footballer, and so is Alicia Eva, and that's probably where the Giants have improved so much this year. And that's their, and that's their midfield. It's hard to think. Emma Swanson probably was the only big name in the midfield last year. Erin McKinnon's a superstar ruck. Had, had another, she had another thirty odd hitouts on Saturday night. But the problem with a good ruck is if you don't have a good midfield to tap it down to, you know, what what what's the use? That's why GWS have. That's why GWS went went for Alicia Eva in the trade period. Because they knew they knew they could get something out of they knew they could get something out of her. Courtney Gum has been a real surprise, but has been a real surprise because she was tipped to go to Adelaide in the AFLW draft last year. That didn't happen. GWS ended up picking her up, and I'm not sure whether or not Adelaide Crows do feel do feel a little bit silly now that they ignored this absolute find, but they should be because if Courtney Gum were playing at Adelaide was playing at Adelaide. She could make a difference. She could have made a difference. Adelaide probably wouldn't have to rely on results to go their way in this final round so so they could sneak into the grand final. GWS a genuine final sprint? Absolutely they are. You look at you look at who they've beaten since since round two. They really they were in front for most of the game, even round one, when they played when they played Melbourne, it was just because Melbourne overpowered them in the last quarter. That's why they lost that game. They've they've won they've they've won most of their games since round two. Since round two, uh, they drew with Adelaide, but they've beaten the Dogs, they've beaten Fremantle, and they've beaten Collingwood. Now Fremantle and Collingwood aren't playing fi- aren't in the finals race this year. Maybe there's a little bit of leeway to that, but this win really proved on Saturday night that GWS do have what it takes to get to the grand final. They play Brisbane next week. Remember the last time they played Brisbane, it was a practice game earlier in the year. They absolutely dominated them. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. A lot of intrigue around Emma Carney as well. She's uh, A couple of sources have said that she could be a kangaroo next year. Hopefully that hopefully that's not the case. I'm not, I'm not trying to sound biased or anything. But the Bulldogs are in a but the Bulldogs are in a really good spot at the moment to be a genuine dynasty. 
The only reason why it could potentially fall off this year is because that them there is no big forward to kick to. Isabel Huntington's gone for the year, and I'm not sure what's happening with Katie Brennan. She might. There's talk she may come back this week. There's talk she may not come back at all. But the bulldog. But the point is the bulldogs have something really good going on there. They've been one of the biggest improvers this year in the women's division. If Emma Carney leaves that to join a fledgling club that may not even win a game this uh, next year, next year, you you have to stop and ask yourself, why would you do that? Would it be the money? Surely it wouldn't be the money. But Emma Carney is a very valuable contributor in the Bulldogs midfield. She She's a ball magnet. She's a ball magnet, wins the clearances, breaks the lines, sets play up, up the ground for the forward. Will she be a Bulldog next year? I don't know. That that that's in her court. The ball's in her court. I hope she stays. There's something great going on at the Bulldogs. They've been widely tipped to be the premiership favourites since Salting Carlton. So I, I I wouldn't see why she would leave. On to the final game. On to the final game of the round. Uh, Carlton continuing their horrible slump. They went down to Melbourne by 35 points on Sunday afternoon at Icon Park. Three four twenty two. The Blues. Melbourne eight nine fifty seven, only four Carlton players getting double figures in disposals. Kate Gillespie, Kate Gillespie Jones led the way with thirteen disposals. Sarah Hosking ten disposals, and George G had ten disposals as well. Under the, under the Melbourne Football Club, three goals each to O'Day, Elise O'Day, and Tegan Cunningham. Shelley Scott nineteen disposals as well. The big talking point though is the knee injury to Mel Hickey. Ah, uh, she's gone for the rest of the year possibly possibly most of next year as well i'm not sure but i'm not sure about that but she's not playing next week against the bulldogs uh also alicia newman also you might remember her for that spectacular running goal earlier in the year but um she's in serious doubt to play next week as well but the the knee injury to mel hickey is probably the more the more damaging because she she provides such such huge drive out, out of Melbourne's back line, and there there was talk that she would play mid a bit more midfield this year, but I don't think that's worked out as well as Melbourne have hoped. But but Mel Hickey is still such an important part of not even, not even just Melbourne's defense, but Mel, Melbourne's team. She set she set such a standard. She set such a standard in terms of. In terms of you know in fitness and professionalism, and it's it, I'm not saying they're going to lose next week, but that's a really huge blow for a game next week that's going to be huge in the context of this season. So I hope I hope Mel Hickey comes back for next year. Probably going to be a huge hill to get back, but Mel Hickey could probably do it. She's a real. F- She's incredibly fit, and she's a sensational player, sensational person. Six, Melbourne kicked six goals in the first quarter. After that, they only kicked two goals for the rest of the game. Something, sa- something says that, that they're um, a little little nervous for next week because, really, they probably should have put Carlton to the sword as much as the Bulldogs did a few weeks ago. But I think, I think, they're, a little, I think they're a little scared. Uh, gra- granted, they, they probably... They, Emotionally, they've probably been struck a blow as well with Hickey going down, but but there is really no excuse to kick six goals in the first quarter and then end up only kicking two for the rest of the game. There, something says that Melbourne they've got a night to next week. I think they're a little nervous because because the Bulldogs will be absolutely hell bent to right the wrong of this weekend when they lost to the Giants. But that's going to be an incredible game to watch. Carlton's year has been has been pretty ordinary, I must say, and 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 it's not even because that they lost to the, the Bulldogs. It stems out a lot further than that. They finished fourth last year. They thought it'd be a great idea to add Taylor Harris in, add Nicholas Stevens in. It looked like they were going to go all out. They wanted they wanted to be a premiership contending team, and the fact is that it hasn't worked out. The big reason for that is. Well, there's a couple of big reasons, but I think the first one is that there is a lack of midfield, a lack of midfield depth, and there's a lack of scoring power because even Darcy Vessio has struggled to score throughout this year, and you don't score without getting good service from your midfield. And that's what she got last year when, when Carlton played. She got good service from the midfield, and nothing has 
gone right this year. They struggled in scoring. They probably had a bit, I think they they might have been close to a dozen times this year where they've had scoreless quarters. Scoreless, not goalless, but scoreless quarters. They were 44-0 down a couple of weeks ago against the Western Bulldogs. That sums up how bad their year has gone. But the second point, and that's and this is a point not to be underestimated, is the influence of Bree Davey, the captain. Injured a knee, injured a knee against the Giants. The Blues won that game. Injured a knee, out for the year. Carlton haven't won a game since. They've lost four in a row. Most of them have been thumpings. And the influence that Bree Davey has on this team is enormous. She can play key back. She can play midfield. She wins the ball, gets people involved. She's a, she's a natural leader. And for her to go down has essentially wrecked the, the Carlton season. Who... <sighs> It's, it's so hard where, where the Blues would be if Bree Davey hadn't injured her knee. But it's clearly obvious that the Blues are not the Blues without Bree Davey. Out of 10, Carlton's season's probably going to get a 2. And and they're even lucky to get the 2. Because there have been so many games this year where I've looked at them and I'm just shaking my head and saying, that's poor. That is poor playing. Their skills aren't really there. And I'm not sure. And I, their recruiting strategy has backfired. And I'm not even, and I'm not even sure why, because apart from losing Bianca Jacobson, Nat Exxon, and Isabella Eyre to trades, most of Carlton's team is still there. I don't, I don't understand the um the omissions of Lauren Arnell midway through the year. Maybe there's maybe there's something wrong with her game. Carlton Carlton coaches aren't happy with her. She was the captain twelve months ago, and she's taken a bit of a fall from grace this year. They'll. They'll end up with the number one pick in the draft this year, most likely. They're not getting through. They're not getting through. They're not winning next week either. They're playing Fremantle and Fremantle. They're going to end up last. They've got a really bad percentage. They are going to have to do something. They're going to have to make something of the number one draft pick. And from there, who knows what will happen? Over to the ladder, and we've got a a game to go. We've got a round to go, and still five teams still in with a chance. You got the Bulldogs and Melbourne both with four wins. The Bulldogs on top with a good percentage of 148. Melbourne second with a percentage of 119. They play each other next week. The winner will get themselves a home final. The loser, if the Bulldogs lose, they're going to have to sweat on some results. They're going to have to sweat on both GWS and Adelaide to lose in order to still be in the chance for the grand final. Melbourne lose. They're they're pretty much gone unless Brisbane beat Ad- unless Brisbane beat GWS by a small margin and Adelaide lose to Collingwood. GWS and Adelaide sit three and four, uh, both with three wins, two losses, and a draw. GWS on third with a percentage of one hundred and twelve. Adelaide with a percentage of one hundred and one. F- in fifth is the Brisbane Lions sitting three and three. Sixth is Collingwood. Then uh, they, sorry, then you got the final three spots with both with all three teams on two wins and four losses. So you got Collingwood with a percentage of one hundred and two. Fremantle with a percentage of 82, and Carlton with a percentage of 47.9. Next week, next week's games, <laughs> well, you got 7 versus 8, the Battle of the Spoon, Carlton, uh, Fremantle versus Carlton, Saturday Twilight game, we'll just run through that one quickly. It's, it's only going to be a game for the Wooden Spoon. I expect Carlton to lose that one. Fremantle, Fremantle's probably going to win comfortably, and they, will, and they will probably want to avoid the Wooden Spoon, because it doesn't really matter if they win the Wooden Spoon, because they get... They they're the only team that get the access to all the to all the Western Australian players or players that want to play in WA. Over to the big game on over to a big game on Friday night. GWS versus Brisbane and Blacktown. Now I've mentioned earlier, GWS won the preseason game by about fifty points, and they've and they haven't lost the game since round two. GWS very very in form at the moment. I think they're going to win. GWS they they will play in the grand final this year. Brisbane have been okay. They haven't lived up to their um. Their expectations of last season, they went through the season undefeated. This season, they've gone through they've gone through three and three, pro- probably three and four. GWS are in a very very good position to play off in the grand finals, and GWS will most likely play the winner of the Bulldogs of Melbourne that are played on the Saturday night at Witten Oval. Now, in the history of these two teams, they've had a a bit, a bit of history dating back to all the exhibition games. <laughs> This is this is undoubtedly the biggest game in the history of these two clubs. The Bulldogs have the Bulldogs have probably been 
one of the best sides all year round. And Melbourne have been up there too, but have, they've lost games that they probably shouldn't have lost. So it's going to be a really hard game to predict this one. But it's also worth mentioning that the Dogs, they've won their two games. At, they've won their two games from two starts at Witten Oval. I'm think, I think the Dogs will just get over the line. They, they will play in the grand final. And if, and it's not bias. They, they still have the team to back it up. Whether or not Katie Brennan plays or not is going to be a different question. But if she plays, then it could, it could change the whole dynamic of this game. Because the Bulldogs have played pretty well without her last few weeks. But let's not get it twisted here. I think Katie Brennan is a wonderful player. Fantastic, fantastically skilled. And she's a, a genuine leader. Then on to the final game on Sunday afternoon. Collingwood and Adelaide Olympic Park. For Collingwood, it doesn't really mean much. Uh, Adelaide has to win, though. They must win this game, but they have to rely on Melbourne and GWS to lose in order to play in the grand final. It doesn't matter if Brisbane win because Adelaide is still half a game ahead of them. Uh, but they can't, they can't underestimate Collingwood. The one thing they absolutely cannot do is underestimate Collingwood because Melbourne and Brisbane, there's probably a sense that they've underestimated them even just a, a slight bit and they've wiped the floor with they pro- probably should have beaten the dogs as well they probably should have beaten the dogs as well we've already mentioned that but i expect but i expect the crows to win they they will they will absolutely win and they'll and they will be hoping for the best i personally don't think it's going to be the case this year adelaide will miss out it, and it'll probably be a western bulldogs gws grand final which leads on to the next topic next next really interesting discussion is Where's the AFLW Grand Final going to be played at? Now, back up a little bit to last year. Last year, they had the Grand Final at Metricon Stadium as the curtain raiser to Gold Coast Brisbane, their round one game. This year is going to be a lot different because the, mo- most likely, the number one ranked side is a Victorian base side. There's talk of it being, of having the game at Icon Park, which probably holds about 22-odd thousand, about 22,000. Now, I'm unsure about it sounds okay when you first think about it, but there'd be a lot of people, a lot of Victorians, that would be interested in watching in watching a Victorian base football club play in the grand final. And I'm a little and I'm a little bit concerned that there's going to be a lockout similar to round one last year when Collingwood played Carlton, first ever AFLW game. Now I might be wrong, maybe wrong. Because a lot of people don't think too kindly of the AFLW, but it's still it's still a really big game for the context of two sides. So the AFL have to, the AFL have to think if it is if it does get to the point where it's a lockout, the next year has to be at a bigger stadium. If it's a Victorian club, it's undoubtedly has to be at a stadium. But at the moment, Icon Park sounds okay. It doesn't. It's uh not. It's not a bad idea, but at the same time. I'm a little worried that Icon Park that Icon Park will basically overflow if if it does come to the conclusion that somewhere down the line two Victorian clubs will be playing off for the grand final. I mentioned we mentioned earlier in earlier in the show that uh, Sarah Allen and Talia Randall from Brisbane both nominated for the Rising Star. At the moment the front runner is Chloe Malloy. And I've got to ask a question. Who can beat Chloe Malloy for the Rising Star Award? She's having a terrific year. She was number three in the draft, and as a forward, she was moved down back round one. Had a really good game, I must say, twenty disposals, and probably had a hand, had a handful of marks. And she looked right at home. Is there anybody that can challenge her? I think there's only one person that can, and she, she and she does wear the red, white, and blue. I'm going to I'm not going to stress this enough. This is not bias. I try to keep it as impartial as possible. But the only one person that can do it wears the red, white, and blue. And her name's Monique Conti. Monique Conti can do it. Since her first game this year, she has improved so much. The last couple of weeks, when she has the ball in congestion, she just finds a way to get out of it. And she uses her pace so well. It's it's hard. It, if, she, if, she, if she doesn't beat Chloe Malloy, she's going to be a really close set. They're both going to be really great players. Let, let, let's, not, let's, not beat, let's not beat that. But even if Monique Conti doesn't win the Rising Star Award, I'd rather her win the Premiership. Because that, 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 that's what people play for, don't they? They play for the Premiership. That brings an end to the AFLW portion of the podcast. Stick around, though, if you want.
We got the AFL. We got the AFL coming up. A lot to talk about there. We've got to talk about the um the pre-game warm-up rule change, uh, which players have impressed during the preseason. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna call out I'm gonna call out champion data because I've absolutely at my wits end with with that. They they they're calling out they're calling out average players and calling them elite. That's uh, very 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 ordinary from champion data. We're gonna talk all about that later. All here on the uh, Docs Footy Talk podcast. Welcome back to the Docs Footy Talk podcast, the second part of the show. Thank you very much if you're still listening. We got a lot to talk about. We've just had the JLT campaign, less than two weeks to go till the regular season kicks off. We're going to talk about some of the uh, the young stars in press during preseason. Champion data, I'm going to call them out, ask to please explain. It's all coming up here in the second part, the AFL section of Doc's Footy Podcast. We'll get started with the uh, the news that they're, they're changing the uh, the pregame warm-ups for this year. Foxfooty.com.au can reveal a list of regulations that was recently distributed to, to each club detailing a series of changes out of the 2018 home and away season. Clubs will no longer be able to warm up as a team on the ground other than briefly before the first bounce. Clubs generally completed a 15-minute warm-up on the field, 25 to 40 minutes out from the first bounce, went back into the rooms and then re-entered the arena for a final kick before the start of the match. What? Is this supposed to prove? I, I quite enjoy watching the players come out half an hour before the game starts, have a kick around, warm up a little bit. That's And that's been a huge part of the game, particularly pre-game. That's been such a huge part of it for so many years now. It, it just continues to prove my point that the AFL are just going to change rules for the sake of changing the rules. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't it doesn't prove anything. Like, why would they do that? Why would they? Why would they stop that? There's also there's also other rule changes as well. Uh, clubs clubs are now required to list four emergency players rather than three. Part of the reason for this change is to accommodate the possibility of a ruckman getting injured in the warm up. The position is more speci- specialized than ever, and four emergencies allowed the coaches more flexibility and insurance. Now that's a rule I actually don't mind because there have been there have been so many cases. Where, where players you know do get injured, and coaches don't even look at the emergencies. They, they pick some. They pick somebody else who wasn't picked, and they go, "Hey, you, come come play last minute." One one example was a game I went to a couple of years ago, Bulldogs and Kilda, and I think, I think I'm pretty sure it was Luke Delaney who wasn't even named in the emergencies. It was a was a late inclusion for I don't I can't recall who it was now, but nonetheless, it. <sighs> Drew a bit of ire from it, and I'm hoping this stops it. It's happened. It's happened since then. Maybe, maybe you know, maybe a rare occasion, but still, the clubs shouldn't have to do that. Clubs don't need to do that. That's why. That's why their emergency four emergencies essentially allows clubs to have a reserve player for each of the four positions on the ground. So you got so you got defence, you got midfield, forward, and the ruckman, and and it should completely eliminate the possibility of a player outside the selected squad. Parachuting into the starting team at the last minute. That's what that's what it says here on foxsports.com.au. Uh, players must cease kicking for goal in the warm-up five minutes before the first bounce, as opposed to three minutes. Giving home teams will enter the arena eleven minutes before play begins. That leaves just six minutes for forwards to practice goal kicking and get an accurate gauge and condition. Approval may, may be sought for players listed on the long-term injury list to be seated on the club interchange bench during matches. Providing the player is listed on the official team sheet as one of the 26 match officials. The pre-match warning siren, which ran three minutes before first bounce, has been removed. It's been replaced by the following sequence. Umpire enters the arena, one siren. Five minutes prior to the match, one siren. Two matches prior to the match start, that gets two sirens. And one minute prior to match start, that's one siren. And these and all of these changes are said to be implemented for the 2018 home and away season. They're very unnecessary. They, these are most of these are very very unnecessary rule changes. What what happened to the old adage? If it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The emer- the emergency one I agree with because I think that I think that's a bit of a problem. Like why why the hell why the hell are clubs opting to pick players who they hadn't even picked to be named last minute? Like I reckon four emergencies is a necessary rule. But the rest of it just sounds so unnecessary. Just sounds stupid it really sounds stupid let me let us let us let me know what you think about that because honestly 
it, it, it continues my theory that the AFL just changes rules for the sake of changing rules. When, when, the, when, they did, when they did that substitute rule about, what, five years ago now, six years ago, th that, was an unne that was an unnecessary rule. Maybe it was supposed to um, produce more scoring, but really, it, it, it's done nothing. And I'm glad they scrapped that a few years ago. But that's just an example of the. But that's just an example of the ridiculousness that the AFL used to ru as rules, as rule changes. Just let 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 them play the game. Let them play the game how it should be played. Because I'm kind of because to be quite honest with you, I'm kind of sick of listening to listening to all these rule changes that the AFL have made, hoping to make the game better. It doesn't make the game better. It just makes the game. You know, not, not not like the game people fell in love with 20 years ago or 10 years ago. Just let them play the game. Let them play the game the way they should be playing. There is an incident that I wanted to look at from this weekend in the JL2 series. Something that really caught my attention is the uh, the, the staging incident between Essen and Geelong. Uh, saw Josh Green take a hit from Mitch Duncan and probably wasn't even a hit per se. It's just like a little tap and Green went down holding his neck. He got he got slapped with a, a fine, I think it was thousand dollars. And hopefully hopefully Michael Christian from Michael Christian's point of view, that sends the message that staging won't be tolerated. And I'm and I hope it does, because there are a lot of there are a lot of folks in the AFL that stage. Josh Green's not the only one. Lindsay Thomas is one that, that gets called out a bit. Uh, Stevie Johnson's been guilty of it. There's been plenty of names. We can even go as you know, recently to say that Alex Rance did something similar last year when it when he went toe to toe with Lance Frank. Staging is you know, people will argue that staging is isn't in the spirit of the game. It's not. AFL is a a very tough sport, and we don't need people acting like acting like soccer players. And I, I don't want I don't want to diss soccer too much. I don't mind watching soccer. I don't mind watching soccer, but there are a lot of people who stage in soccer, and and they get away, and they almost get away with, it. they pretty much get away with it scot free. The AFL, the AFL doesn't want to be in that same spot. So, do I think punishment fit of the crime? Absolutely, it did. People, people will look at that and will think, oh man, I've got, to, oh man, I've got to stop, I've got to stop flinging around and carrying on like a pork chop, because I'm going to get slapped with a thousand dollars. Now, for the AFL player, a thousand dollars doesn't mean much. Some people will probably ignore that, but the thing is, if you keep ignoring it, there's probably going to be even bigger consequences. I'm not sure if this is this is part of the the AFL, but this should be like a a three strikes policy. If Josh Green does it like another couple of times, then he should get then he should get a week or two weeks. I reckon two weeks sounds pretty good. Some might call it harsh, but I think it's fair. If the AFL is serious on cracking down on cracking down staging, then that's how then that's how it really should be done. Because it, it it's an ugly look in the game. I hate personally I hate people staging for free kicks. I've I've never done it. It's it's not to say it's in the spirit of, to say it's not in the spirit of the game is a pretty valid point. People play the game you want to see people play the game hard and fair. You don't want to see people getting a feather touch and then flopping to the ground like a sack of spuds. You don't you don't I don't want that. I don't think you guys want that. I think this is fantastic from the match review panel, which uh, le leads me to the um, the, J the JLT campaign in its entirety. Um, obviously, the first thing you want to you want to find out when it comes to the preseason is you know who, who, who out of the recruits, the draftees, who looked good, who looked good, what are the signs, can. Who who can play round one? Uh, the first people that do come to mind was would, would be Jack Watts's six goal game against Adelaide on the weekend. Never did that when he was in Melbourne, but but somehow he has a couple of games in Port in Port Adelaide colours, and all of a sudden he's living up to uh, the expectations of a number one draft pick. I'll probably talk more. I'll probably talk a little bit more about Jack Watts at another time. But personally, I think the move from away from Melbourne has done him so much good. Is it gonna is it gonna is this gonna 
carry on to consistent performances and expectations of a number one draft pick, it's hard to tell right now because preseason games, a lot of people call out call out and say it doesn't mean much. It means a little bit. Let let let's not let's not be too hasty on this. Preseason games do mean a little bit. It means people fine tune for the season ahead. It means people. It means teams will, you know, they want to get things right. They want to get games into young boys. They want to get games into the recruits. Don't, 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 don't come at me and say preseason games don't mean nothing. They do. They do mean something. Not, not premiership points. They don't mean premiership points, but they mean something. They mean, they mean, they mean getting, get your structures right, get your team right, get match fitness in. Um, so. Yeah, the, the, case, the first case of points, Jack Watts. Six goals on the weekend. Match-winning performance put out against the Crows in Alberton. Uh, it, it, it's a good first game, and I'm very interested to see how that translates come round one. The power play uh, Fremantle round one, Saturday Saturday Twilight, Adelaide Oval. It's probably going to be a good first game for Jack Watts. Nobody, nobody's going to expect him to kick six goals weekly. He may kick six goals against Fremantle. We'll wait until that happens. But it's it, it's it's pretty positive from Jack Watts after a, a Melbourne career that I can only describe as probably frustrating for him, given that he came into the club as given that he came into the club as a seventeen year old in a really, really bad and struggling Melbourne side. Another 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 person I want to mention off the top of the bat is uh, Aaron Norton from the Bulldogs. He was tipped as a top five selection in the draft last year has been really has looked really really at home in his two preseason games i've watched him a little bit closely at the, at the night of the draft i was actually a little disappointed because i i wanted somebody at half back to replace you know bob murphy and and matthew boyd but w- watching aaron norton he just looks so composed in defense his one on one needs a bit of work because he he was playing on he was playing on Jared Ruffhead, and he, was playing, and he was playing on a much bigger Mason Cox as well in those two preseason games. But that, but that, that, that's unfair to criticise him on that because he's only a boy, he's only a young kid. What he does around the ground is sensational. He can he floats in, takes intercept marks. He reads the play so good, and he and he's a really good kick. Even when even when we go back even further. To AFLX, he played the two games. He was he was quite good. He, he he could kick a goal. He knew where the goals were. I don't like talking about AFLX too much, but from those from those games, you can almost 99.9 percent lock in Aaron Norton round one when the Dogs play the Giants. I also want to mention the uh, the Richmond Football Club. Um, just not not any of the recruits. But just how strongly they performed in the JLT series campaign because they they beat Essendon by about 80, 87 points, eighty seven points first week, and in the second week they beat North Melbourne by seven. Now, if anybody has any theories that Richmond are going to suffer what the Bulldogs did last year and that's a premiership hangover, they're going to be very wrong because the way that Richmond moved the footy in those two weeks was almost identical. To, to them moving the ball, particularly in that last part of the year, when they won when they won it all, people only think people will only think, oh, Richmond's only a, a, a Dustin Martin, Alex Rance, Jack Rewalt team. It's not a, it's not just that. They've got solid players that do their bit all over the ground. You think of guys like Josh Caddy, Nick Vloston, Kane Lambert, Jack Graham. Jack Graham only played five game played the last five games in, in his in his you know short career. And, and he he was almost he was almost in the hunt for the Norm Smith last year. Basha Hawley, Dan Butler, Daniel Rioli is going to be a really good player, and Jason Castagna. There's it, there's more to this Richmond team than just Dusty and Rance and Cochin and Rewalt. There is so much more to them. I haven't heard much about uh, their first pick, Jack Higgins, so far this year, but when they when they picked him up in the draft, then you know, that absolute that was absolutely absolutely startling because. A lot of people had ranked Jack Higgins as a top 10 pick. Some people even ranked him as the best talent in the draft. So when he when he so what is what happens at pick 17 is that everybody else has has looked past this young fella 
and Richmond have gone, right, let, 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 let's go with him. Some say the best talent in the draft, but I'd, I'd still watch out for him because a lot of people say he's got a bit of Toby Green about him. Now, I'm not saying that in the sense of he's, he's a real hothead, he'll, he's capable of a lot of brain fates. No, but what, what people, fa- people fail to overlook with Toby Green sometimes is that he's a match winner. He's an absolute ma- he, he can He can give you bags of three goals and four goals without breaking a sweat. He's a he's a very good player, Toby Green. And if Jack Higgins is anything like him, even even maybe even half as good, then Richmond have plucked then Richmond have plucked a gem. Richmond have plucked a gem with with the seventeenth pick. Uh, also also want to mention uh, Jake Stringer, of course. Now we don't have we don't have any booze here, and we won't do that because because you know, I still I still have a bit of respect for Jake Stringer. But his first, but the first game he played was an absolute stinker. I'd, I'd probably say, I'd say, I, I won't, I don't want to use it as, as an excuse. But he did, su- he did have a cut to his head early in the, early in the game. It looked really, really bad, and it, it probably, probably wouldn't have, it probably would have been hard to shake because he had, a, he, he took a really big hit from, I think it was Alex Rance in the, in their preseason game a couple of weeks ago. Last on, on Sunday against Geelong. He showed signs of the stringer of old. Kicked a couple of goals, had had himself about 13, 13 disposals. But most importantly, yes, and yes, and teammates, they're publicly going out and saying that they're loving what he's doing. They're loving what he's doing on the training track. You know, we we can be quick to criticise all the tattoos that he's getting and everything else, but. When we're judging him from a footy standpoint, he's doing everything what S- he's doing everything Essendon have asked him to. We haven't heard we haven't heard a bad thing come out of there since he was acquired from the Bulldogs. So if, you know, if and he, and from all reports, he's he's been really work he's really working on the on his endurance. They see they see him as a more of a half forward up the ground midfielder type more than a stay at home. Stay at home, but muscle muscle your way through three defenders, sort of forward. But if the bombers are happy, if the bombers are happy with what he's doing, then there's not, not much more I can say about that. Bryce Gibbs, we want to mention as well. He's been very, very handy since coming across from Carlton. He had twenty disposals, seven tackles against Port on the weekend. Is he really the missing piece though for Adelaide? Adelaide, Adelaide, probably the best side in the competition last year, only only to get thumped by Richmond. Now I'm not saying Richmond are a really bad side. Probably Richmond deserved to win on the day, but Adelaide have probably been one of the best sides all year. <laughs> a lot of talk about whether or not Bryce Gibbs is the missing midfield piece, because apart from that, they're almost settled. They've almost got a really good side on all lines. Yes, Jake Lever is going to be a, a, a bit of a blow, but they've they've got players there that that are ready. To take him on. A lot, lot of raps on uh, Tom Dode. Um, he was taking... They're liking him a lot. And, um, Charlie Cameron's also going to be another somewhat of a blow. But they've still got they've still got a lot of options up forward. Eddie Betts can still play. Josh Jenkins is struggling now, but he can kick goals. Doesn't matter how he gets them, as long as they're getting goals. Taylor Walker is... Taylor Walker's their captain. He can kick a goal. And you've got Mitch McGovern. Who who can probably step in and fill the role? He's a really good he's a really good athlete, and a really a really good kick for goal. Plus you, plus on, on on top of that you got guys like Tom Lynch. He he's he's the glue guy in Adelaide's forward line. He can kick goal. He kicks goals, sets them up, does it does what he wants with the ball in hand, and it's usually ending up in an Adelaide goal. So I'm I'm not I'm not worried about Adelaide in the slightest. I think they'll be up there again. Is Bryce Gibbs missing pace? I'm not sure. Um, the one flaw in his game really is his, is his contested footy, but he's not really a contested football person. He's he's more of the he's more of the uh, the outside specialist. You got, you got your inside footballers, Matt. You got the Crouch brothers. You got Rory Sloan. Rory Atkins can win you hardball. So you know, Bryce Gibbs doesn't need Bryce Gibbs doesn't need to win hardball, despite the fact that people make fun of him for being soft. Doesn't matter as long as he does his job. Uh, Nick, Nick Caulfield had a really good game on I think it was when Thursday night in the first game against uh, no Wednesday night yeah Wednesday night against Carlton in the first week 
he had twenty he had twenty disposals. He was the man I actually wanted the Bulldogs to take, but St Kilda plucked him a pick early. They had they had seven eight, they had picked seven and eight in the draft. They went with Caulfield at eight. And they went with uh, Hunter Clark at seven, who I think is going to be a very good player. He, kicked, he had twelve disposals and kicked two goals against Carlton. And the and the and the week after against Melbourne, he had eight disposals to kick the goal. So not only Hunter Clark is a can find the ball, he's able to kick goals. So I reckon St Kilda have really plucked themselves a couple of great players there. They'll, will they play round one? I think they will. Uh, Hunter Clark will probably the, the both of them will find themselves on the bench somehow. Caulfield's a really good user of the footy. He had 70 disposal against Melbourne on on the Friday night, I think it was, or Thursday night, I should say. And he's a a genuine leader. They they should both line up for St Kilda round one. I tuned into the Collingwood Bulldogs game as as a Bulldogs supporter would on Saturday, and I was really impressed with with this young fellow by the name of Sam Murray, who was uh who was ta- who was a former rookie from Sydney Swan. The Pies the Pies gave up. This year's second round pick, and I think it was, I think it was last year's third round pick to get him as well. This, at the time of the trade, it sounded really, really ridiculous because Sam Murray hadn't even played a game. He was a rookie listed, rookie listed from Sydney, and here are the Pies paying huge overs to get somebody who hasn't even played a football game. But he showed, he showed everybody. He proved me wrong on on Saturday. He had a really good game. He had twenty four disposals. Number of number of rebound fifties. I think it was about seven. Had nine marks. He was def- definitely amongst one of Collingwood's better players. And he didn't 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 play in the first game against GWS. But if we're basing round one teams on performances like that, he will play. He will absolutely play round one. Despite the one flaw in his game being his kicking, I think he he gets a lot of the ball. He can run. He can create. He can do a lot of good things with the ball. And finally, I want to want to highlight Fremantle, Fremantle's two top five picks from last year's draft. Andrew Brayshaw and Adam Shera. Pro- predominantly, I'm going to talk about Brayshaw because he played both of the uh, JLT games. He had a really good game on, on Sunday against West Coast. He had 19 disposals and nine tackles. He's going to, he's going to play round one for sure. Adam Chera, I'm not really too sure about. He didn't 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 play on the Sunday, and I'm pretty sure he didn't play on the um in the first week either. It's no surprise that the, that Adam Chera is a, a super a super leader, and he's a, he's a very good user of the footy when he when he does get on the park. Andrew Brayshaw will play round one, no de- no doubt. He's He's tough. He's he's already shown he can mix it with big boys, and he would he would probably and if he's and working under players like Nat Fife and Lockie Neal, yeah, we 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 give Fremantle a bit of a stick all the time about you know how bad they are, but you're working under two really good midfielders, two superb ball magnets. You you're playing under you, if you play under those two. And you absorb what they teach you. They're going to get you're going to you're going to, you're going to be a really good player. And Andrew Brayshaw will be a good player. All right, it's time it's time I call out Champion Data because for years now we've for years now I've seen them release their list of elite so called elite players. And honestly, this and honestly this this year's list has almost made me throw up. Have a look at what I've got here in front of me here. The uh ten the ten biggest shocks from Fox Sports is the uh players that were ranked by champion data as elite. You got Daniel Rich from Brisbane who's ranked elite as a defender, number one in the league for most com- uh, for the combined most inside fifties and rebound fifties, twelve for meters gained. Jack Crisp rated elite as a general defender Elite within the competition for pressure and intercept possessions. Anthony McDowell Tip Woody from Essendon ranked elite as a forward, ranked elite for pressure acts while the team scored from 27% of his turnovers. Sam Menegola from Geelong and also Daniel Menzel from Geelong. Menegola is a mid forward, only player ranked in this position to 
be elite for disposals, meters gained, and tackles per game. Menzel's, Menzel's a general forward, ranked ranked third for goals amongst forwards last amongst the general forwards last year. You got Aaron Hall from the Gold Coast, elite as a wing, second second in the league for meters gained out of all non defenders. Christian Petrarca, elite as a mid forward, second highest contested possession rate for his position. Shane Edwards, elite as a mid forward, elite for scoring assists and stepped up when needed. Uh, Jack Sinclair, elite as a wing, and Tom Papley, rated elite as a general forward. Now, none of these, none of these players, in the public eye, are elite. In some eyes, perhaps Christian Petrarca is, and I, and I'm not saying he's not going to be an elite defender, but he's still got a lot of room to grow. Sam Menegola is a really good player, but I'm not convinced he's elite just yet. He's a and McDonald Tip and Woody, as much as I love him, he's nowhere near elite. He's a great tackler. He's a he's a good forward. Can get can get your goals. And Tom Papley, <laughs> Tom Papley and, and and Jack Sinclair, give me a break. These guys aren't these guys aren't elite. They're good, but they're not elite. And Shane Ed, Shane Edwards is nowhere near. He's he's yeah. All these players. Maybe bar Jack Crisp, I don't really rate him that good. Very, very average player. Daniel Rich has a good kick on him. But apart from that, all these guys are good players, but they're not there yet. Now, if you look, now if you look at the, um, the list below that on Fox Sports, there's the 10 biggest snubs, which include Zach Merritt, who was All-Australian last year. Josh Kelly was rated All-Australian. Dylan Shield was all Australian. Joel Selwood somehow got all Australian, but I actually, but that was probably that's probably the one snub I actually do agree with. Tom Mitchell was all Australian last year. Clayton Oliver averaged thirty disposals for a player in his second year. Luke Parker and Marcus Bontempelli were all Australians in the last few years. So you, so. You, I, I demand an ex, I demand an explanation from Champion Data as to why players such as Jack Crisp, Jack Sinclair, Shane Edwards they get they get named elite above players like Josh Kelly, Tom Mitchell, Clayton Oliver, Luke Parker, and Bonton Pelly. These guys, the guys that are mentioned as the snubs, <laughs> they have they have they have won games before whether they rack up disposals at, at will or they actually kick goals off their own boot but I'll be damned if this, if this keeps up I they've they've even they've even put Jaden hunt in the elite category now don't get me wrong J- Jaden hunt is a really good runner can can break the lines whenever he whenever he almost pleases but he's not a genuine game changer. People people run and break the lines from halfback all the time. Jason Johansson does it. He's an elite player. And hell, he had an ordinary year last year at the best of times. Couldn't shake a tag in the second half of the year. I'm honestly Champion Data is Champion Data has to explain themselves because honestly, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely poor, and and really, it's an insult to players like Josh Kelly, an insult to players like Dylan Shield, an insult to Marcus Bontempelli. It's absolutely disgraceful, and I've had an, and I've had enough. Champion data can just go. I've had enough of it. Absolutely, absolutely, at my wits' end about that. We were talking about re- recruits who impressed in the JLT series earlier. One one player I did fail to mention was uh, Luke Davies Uniac, who was taking fourth in the draft overall by uh, North Melbourne. And uh, if anybody says that he's not playing round one, go away. He is he had twelve disposals against Melbourne in the first week. He had about sixteen the week after against Richmond, and. There's a bit to like about. 
He's, he's tough. He can break the lines. And he's already, and, and he's and for North for North supporters anyway. He, he's absolutely loving it. Absolutely loving the club. So I don't think he's going away anytime soon. There is there is a bit of talk of him saying there is an article that I found the age the other day that I found pretty fascinating. It's it says here and and I, and I quote but I do want to, in the future, be that Dusty Martin type who can go down forward and be a good presence. That's something really huge for um, North Melbourne supporters to talk about because Dust, Dustin Martin, you're not, you're not going to get a bigger name in football at the moment than Dustin Martin. Maybe Patrick Dangerfield, but at the moment, Dustin Martin's at the top of the mountain. He's won the Premiership, Brownlow Medal, Norm Smith Medal, All-Australian, all, all last year. He probably could have won other things as well, but... Let's just stick to football. So to aspire like him is huge. And the club's already shown their faith in him. He's uh, extended, his, extended his original deal by two years. So he's he's not going anywhere until 2022. So that, that's huge. Will he be the next Dustin Martin? Will he be the next Patrick Dangerfield? The man who can go... The man that can have such a huge presence in the midfield and then go down forward, kick your bag of three or four, possibly five. Not, 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 it's not ridiculous. It's not a ridiculous proposition because Luke Davies Uniac could have gone number one last year. I, 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 I definitely had him at number one, but I think the consensus was that Cam Rayner was number one because when he does eventually build the endurance tank, Cam Rayner can be something huge. They 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 all they also liked him to a, a Dustin Martin. He's a contested bull. He goes up forward, kicks kicks you some goals. He's already got he's already got that sort of Dustin Martin presence. The only problem is though, he just doesn't have the tank to run with. Luke Davies Uniac has probably does have a better tank and he can break the lines and he's and he's a good size too i think he's what 186 or something 180 where are we at 188 he's 188 so he's 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 a decent size he's he's also this article in the age also sees dave zuniak get huge praise from a really, really good, a really, really good football back in the day. Matthew Lloyd, Essendon champion. Matthew Lloyd says in the same article, and I quote, he's the best junior footballer I've seen. You watch guys like Dangerfield and Martin that can be powerful forwards. He's in that mold. He's the modern day midfield. Now this is huge. This is, I've already said that it's, it's huge. Because this man hasn't played a game of regular season AFL yet. And already people are going to compare him to Dangerfield, Dustin Martin. And it's not, ridic- it's not ridiculous. Because he's young, the potential's enormous. But let's just cool it down. Well, just one bit. He's only, he's only, what, 18? He hasn't played a game. Let's just see where it goes from here. He was okay in the he was okay in the JLT. He's going to play round one. Will he? Will he go forward? Will he take the mark? Will he fend off blokes like Dusty? Let Let's not Let's not go too far with this. But I did I did find that very very interesting. Last thing I want to make before we sign off here is um. Dermot Burton made a call on the Western Bulldogs after their win against Hawthorne in the first week of the JLT series, and says that, and says in his words, they there is they can make the grand final again. Well, this is this is again we're not even a game into the regular season, and people are already going to make 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 calls so big like that. Like I get it, it it's it's the media. People have to make big calls. But one win over Hawthorne, one preseason win over Hawthorne, 
doesn't make the site. Granted, the last team that did fail to make the finals after winning the Premiership was Hawthorne about nearly 10 years ago. And I expect the Bulldogs to bounce back like the Hawks did. I'm not saying they're going to be a dynasty like the Hawks. I hope so. But they're not going to be the same team. They'll, they'll, will they play finals? I think they can. Can they make the grand final again? Probably not this year. But they could probably do it somewhere down the line. I do have, for the record, I do have them finishing in the top eight. They're probably in the they, they are in the they are in the bottom half of this eight though, and I don't expect them to go too far. There's a, there's still a little bit of work to be still a little bit of work to be done with the Bulldogs, and we will leave it at that. Well, there we go. For, first episode all done for the week. Um, try not to be too harsh. For, first podcast episode ever, and as uh, and as. They say the first podcast is always the hardest. Um, a big, a big thank you for all those that have that have stuck around with me for the, this whole hour and a bit. And until next week, it's goodbye for now. <laughs>